So some have argued that even if I'm a committed vegetarian my whole life, it's not clear that this actually could save even one animal's life. And that's because meat production isn't sensitive to demand in such a fine-grained way. So the supply chain of meat is just too complex to respond to an individual's decision to buy or, or not to buy meat. So does this make it futile to be a vegetarian? I don't accept the argument that you're putting forward there. Um, what we should act on is the expected value of our decisions. Obviously, we can't know what results will come from our decisions, but we have to go by probabilities. That's the guide of life. So even though it's true that the supply chain is uh, not sensitive to the purchase of one chicken, let's say, um, if you're avoiding chicken your entire life, um, then I think the expectation is that many of your days when you don't eat a chicken will have no effect. But every now and again, one day when you don't buy a chicken will have a very large effect because there must be a cutoff point somewhere at which the supermarket or wherever you'd be buying from will say, oh, we're not selling enough chickens. Let's order 200 fewer chickens tomorrow, right? So what if I eat a hamburger just once a year? I think the expected value question is the same. I mean, the benefit to you, if there is any benefit, I, I would argue there's actually a negative uh, benefit to you, uh, harm to you by eating it. But, but if there were a benefit, then the benefit is smaller uh, and the chances of it making a difference are smaller. But uh, in, I think it all averages out. I mean, I, I can't understand how otherwise you could have a supply and demand system if it doesn't, if, if it doesn't average out over the long run. And if each individual decision doesn't have a chance of affecting the supply. So what if the hamburger is produced from a happy cow? Would that make it better? So a cow that had a good life with lots of space in a pleasant meadow that was slaughtered painlessly. Would, would you have any objection against eating a happy cow? A hamburger made from uh, a happy cow? I think cow? the objection is uh, uh, somewhat mitigated there. Um, I do think clearly it's, it's better to eat the meat of animals who've led happy lives and the meat of animals who've suffered. Uh, I think you still have to think about a, a number of different factors. One is the impact that your example is having because uh, is it going to be clear to people that you're conscientious in your choice of meats? I mean, if you make a big point about that and everybody who sees you eating the hamburger knows that you wouldn't have eaten it if it was not from a, a cow that had a happy life, um, that might meet that objection. Um, then there's questions about uh, you know, was the animal happy throughout its life? Was it, for example, perhaps happy for most of its life, but then transported to a slaughterhouse in horrible conditions and killed in a, in a brutal way? So there's a lot to find out. And finally, and this applies particularly if you're talking about cows, um, there is the impact on climate change that uh, you're having. And, and uh, ruminant animals, cattle and sheep, um, are particularly large contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. So that isn't helped by the fact that it's a happy cow. In fact, there's some evidence that uh, cattle on grass produce more greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of meat produced than cattle who are fed grain. Economic arguments might suggest that if fewer people buy meat, the price of meat will go down, which will result in others buying more meat. So could this make it futile to be a vegetarian? Um, I think that what we, we don't know a lot about consumer purchases and consumer to what extent it's, it's relevant. I think the, what you need to hope is that if fewer people buy meat, the price of meat drops below the production costs. Uh, so, so what the uh, producers are getting no longer covers their costs. And if it no longer covers their costs, then the fact that more people want to buy it isn't going to help. Um, it's only if they come in and push the price up again so that the producers do cover their costs. Um, so it depends on a, a number of questions that I don't think we really know the answer to. The other factor that you have to take into account here is, can you build up a critical mass of people who are avoiding meat um, and thereby creating a market for uh, plant-based alternatives to meat? And I think that's in fact already starting to happen. We're starting to see more and better uh, plant-based alternatives to meat on sale, not just in specialist uh, health food stores, but in mainstream supermarkets. And I think if we need to encourage that trend, because uh, 
if these products become uh, economical, more environmentally sustainable than meat, um, obviously less cruel than meat, and uh, comparable in taste uh, to meat, then I think we have a real chance of um, essentially replacing the entire meat production industry. So here's another possible argument against vegetarianism. So in a recent article in The Conversation, Mike Archer refers to figures that suggest that in Australia, 25 times more animals die in the production of plant protein than in the production of the same amount of protein from grass-fed cattle and sheep. And that's, for example, because many animals die when the fields are ploughed or when their habitat is destroyed to make space for crops. So does this make it unethical for Australians to be vegetarian? Well, I think uh, Michael Archer really gets this wrong because, uh, firstly, uh, this would only apply to completely grass-fed meat. It wouldn't apply to uh, animals that have been fed grain even for part of their lives. And the vast majority of Australian beef comes from animals who are fed grain uh, at least for the last three months of their lives. And because it's so inefficient to feed grain to cattle, um, you're actually having to produce more grain and therefore kill more of these small rodents and other animals in the wheat fields by uh, feed, growing grain, feeding it to animals and then eating the meat. So you're actually um, reducing the number of small animals if you eat the grain directly than if you eat the grain after it's been cycled through the animal. Um, now if you just would say, well I'll only eat the grass-fed meat, um, then there are still some things to be said about that. One is, as I've already mentioned, uh, you are making a major contribution to greenhouse gases. Um, and that's something that uh, I think needs to be taken into account as well. The other thing is that Archer suggests that there's less suffering, not just less killing, but less suffering. Um, and I think he's wrong about that because he says the, the cattle are killed humanely. But even if the actual moment of death is humane, uh, if you look at cattle in Australia's rangelands, which basically means places in the more remote regions of the north and northwest of Australia, these cattle are rounded up um, in horrible conditions. I've seen this happen because they're pretty much wild animals. They haven't really had contact with humans very often. And then they're, they're rounded up, they're terrified, they're herded onto trucks, and then they're driven on these trucks, maybe a thousand kilometres, maybe 1500 kilometres, you know, very long distances. To, um, to slaughterhouses uh, and perhaps in great heat and uh, without, being, without stopping to be fed and watered. I think it's a quite horrible process. And if you compare that with um, a mass, let's say, that is killed by the harvester, um, it has a pretty quick death compared to the suffering that the cattle have gone through. So billions of animals suffer tremendously in the livestock industry. Now, if it became technically possible, would it be okay to use gene editing to produce livestock that can't feel pain? Uh, I certainly think it would be better if livestock could not feel pain. Um, of course, we're not just talking about physical pain. We're also talking about mental suffering, like boredom from confinement in cages or stress from those conditions. So uh, if you could actually uh, get rid of that, um, and then I think that would be a preferable situation uh, to the present one. Uh, I, again, there would still be other reasons. Even if you completely eliminate the suffering, there would still be... Uh, environmental reasons, I think, for trying to eliminate um, particularly the ruminant animals, but uh, also from the point of view of wasting grain, you would still want to eliminate the, the rest of the meat industry as well. But, but it would be a different kind of issue. Uh, if there was no suffering, then uh, there would be more, more relating to environmental questions rather clearly than, than uh, animal welfare questions because the animals wouldn't have a welfare. But isn't there a risk that this will result in even more people consuming meat because they will think that it's less ethically problematic now? This is the kind of thing that has also been said about other reforms that have already happened. For example, the idea that uh, in the European Union that uh, there are restrictions on how you can keep hens. You can't keep them in the standard small wire cages that you used to. Um, and the same with pigs and veal calves. They have to be able to turn around and move a little bit, which previously they didn't. And some people worried that this would actually lead to a greater acceptability of meat consumption. But if you look at what's happened in the European Union since those reforms have been introduced, which is now, I think they started around 2010, if I remember rightly. So we've now got sort of seven years. And 
Uh, in fact, it doesn't seem that there has been an increase in meat consumption. Rather, it seems there's been an increase in acceptance of vegetarian and, and vegan food. So, um, so I think that perhaps this effect would not take place. I can't be sure, of course, but, um, but I think it's reasonable that it would be a sign of increased concern about animals that would make people think more about animals and um, maybe therefore they would still be reluctant to eat them. Do you think schools should offer only vegetarian or, or vegan food? Um, because perhaps this would be a good way to steer younger generations towards eating no or less meat. I think that would be an excellent move, yes, um, if, uh, if schools were prepared to do that, of course. Uh, there's always a question about how much, particularly if you're talking about government schools here, private schools can do what they like, I guess. And, uh, but uh, if you're talking about government schools, there's always a question about how far a government can get ahead of where the population is. So um, I think that might work in some regions where there's very high acceptance of arguments against eating meat, but probably in mainstream schools then they're, they're not just ready just not ready for it yet do you think people are reluctant to do this because they're concerned about the health of the children uh, i imagine that there would be some concerns about the health of the children and of course those who are trying to promote the production and sale of meat would stir up those fears as much as they could but uh, i think there's well, certainly, if you're just talking about a vegetarian diet, I think there's no question that a vegetarian diet can be a perfectly healthy way of nourishing children and um, probably healthier than a meat-based one. Um, if you're talking about a vegan diet, uh, a little bit more care would be needed. Um, you would need to make sure that children got enough B12, for example. Um, so uh, there might be more concerns, but I think we're understanding more about how to do that. I think we can have uh, fortified foods that contain the necessary ingredients. So probably this is a little futuristic, but if we're talking about uh, over the next decade or so, then I think it's possible that we could uh, meet those concerns about the, the health of the children. Do you think that we should protect certain animals more than others? If you're talking about the entire zoological kingdom of everything that counts as an animal, then definitely uh, we should protect those animals that are capable of suffering uh, and we don't have to protect those that are not. So I think a, an oyster zoologically is an animal, but I think it's unlikely that bivalves like oysters and mussels and clams are capable of suffering. So I don't think they need protection in themselves. Once you get beings who can suffer, then the question is, can you have gradations between some who can suffer more uh, in different ways? And that's possible, but um, I think we don't quite know enough about that yet. I mean, we assume that animals with higher cognitive capacities are capable of suffering more, um, but it's not absolutely clear that that's right. And I think there's still a lot of work to be done to try to establish how much different species are capable of suffering and what cognitive capacities have to do with suffering. Should we grant legal rights to the most intelligent animals? So legal rights along um, the lines of basic human rights. So for example, should chimpanzees have the right not to be killed or, or not to be tortured? Yes, that's what I've argued together with Paolo Cavalieri in the, the Great Ape Project, that uh, we should extend those rights to great apes in particular, because they seem to us the clearest cases of beings who are close to us in terms of their intelligence, their self-awareness, their uh, deep social relationships, and so on. Um, it's not that we want to draw a line sort of between great apes and um, lesser apes or other primates or anything like that. Rather, we see this as a way of narrowing the gap between humans and non-humans in general. So at the moment, we sort of think that there's humans here and then there's all animals over here. And uh, somehow all animals are pretty similar, but humans are very different. And obviously, any zoologist or biologist will tell you that that's wrong. In evolutionary terms, it's clearly wrong. You know, the, relationship between us and a chimpanzee is closer than the relationship even between a chimpanzee and an orangutan, let alone between a chimpanzee and a dog or a cat. The idea is to, to draw humans and non-human animals closer by extending legal rights, at least initially, to those non-humans who are most like us in their abilities and social relations and emotional life and so on. And then hopefully we will get extended further as well, but you need to make a start somewhere.
in the future it may be possible to eat in vitro meat, so real meat grown in the laboratory. Would it be okay to eat that? Yes, I certainly think it would. There would be no suffering involved. Um, it looks like uh, one estimate I saw says it would reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of meat production by 97%. So uh, this would be clean, environmentally uh, safer and uh, no suffering. So yes, I think that would be excellent if we can produce that economically. Is it okay to eat insects? Uh, with insects, I think we still don't really know uh, enough about their possible consciousness. You could argue that it's better to eat insects than to eat uh, other animals, vertebrates say particularly, because with vertebrates we can be highly confident that they can suffer and with insects we don't really know they may suffer or they may not. On the other hand, people will say, yes, but to get a meal, you're going to have to eat a large number of insects, you know, whereas you only need to eat even just a small piece of a cow, let's say, to, to have a meal. So maybe that balances out in terms of the probabilities. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, would, I would hope that we will learn more about the likelihood of different insects being conscious. We, we shouldn't assume that, you know, either all insects are conscious or none of them. There's enormous variety in insects. Uh, I've seen arguments that suggest that perhaps bees are conscious because of the uh, learning, the things that they can do, the sophisticated communication and so on. Whereas perhaps mealworms uh, are not conscious. Um, so in that case, it would be all right to eat mealworms, but um, not bees. You know, not that anyone's proposing eating bees, but I guess there are other crickets, for example, that may be more complicated than mealworms again. Um, so I think it does depend a little bit on, on what insects we're talking about, but also on how much we can learn about the possibility that they're conscious. Jeff Mann has argued that we should prevent the pain and suffering of wild animals. Um, so, for example, presumably if we could stop a lion from killing an antelope by giving him other food, perhaps roadkill, then we should. Um, what do you think about that? I agree in principle that we should try to reduce the suffering of wild animals as well as of the domestic animals. Uh, Exactly how we do that without having other bad consequences isn't uh, easy to see. But um, yes, if, if, if we could do it, then that would be a good thing to do. Shelley Kagan has argued that if we could make fish smarter, for example, through gene editing, we should. Do you agree? Um, I haven't actually seen that article, that, that argument. It's, I don't know whether he uh, wrote in an article, but he told me in an interview. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Maybe, I mean, but it's, it's possible that it makes them suffer more, right? It depends a bit. Uh, I mean, are we talking about, uh, if we're talking about gene editing fish, are we talking about fish who will then be farmed as in aquaculture? Um, they may suffer more because they're still trapped in this tank and they're smarter and they're now more aware of the being frustrated and bored and so on. Um, on the other hand, maybe if we could make wild fish smarter, they wouldn't swallow those hooks and, uh, or, or they'd stay out of those nets and maybe that would be a good thing to do. You've often defended positions that rely on the importance of impartiality, so roughly the idea that we should give equal way to all with equal interests. However, sometimes you've questioned whether impartiality is always possible or desirable. So to what extent or when is it permissible to be partial? So for example, suppose you have a painkiller and can give it to your child to cure her headache or use it to prevent the same amount of pain in a chimpanzee. Would it be okay to give it to your child? And if so, is it because she's your child or because she's in the same species? It's the same amount of pain in yeah, these cases? Yeah, it's the same amount of pain. Then I think it's okay to give it to your child because there's no, you're not, uh, you're not, you know, you, it's not really favoring. I mean, you could say, well, you ought to toss a coin, but I don't really see the reason for that. I think uh, either choice is acceptable. And if, if, if you argue, well, I will feel better if I give it to my child because I love my child, then there's a little bit of extra happiness that comes from you giving it to your child. So uh, if it's the same amount, I think, yes, it's permissible to give it to your child. So and suppose the, the chimpanzee had a, a, a much worse headache in your child. Yeah, then it a... starts to become more doubtful. Um, and I would then say it's better to give it to the chimpanzee. But um, on the other hand, if someone did give it to their child, this would be, uh, I think, a case of, of what Parfit called blameless wrongdoing. So uh, it's the wrong choice. 
but we don't blame somebody for being a loving parent who cares about their child because in general we want to encourage people to be loving parents and to um, you know, bring up children who will be happy and so on. So uh, I think that it's, it's, it would be the wrong choice, but I would not blame the parent who did that. So could you give people uh, concerned about animal suffering some practical advice? So I think what many find difficult is that it's all a bit overwhelming. It seems that whatever we eat, we may contribute to animal suffering. So when we eat one hamburger a year, when we eat vegetables, when we eat soy, um, when we eat products with palm oil and so on. So if we want to be careful, what should we do? Well, I still think the, the biggest uh, single thing that you can do to reduce animal suffering from that perspective is to avoid factory farm products. So um, avoid the factory farmed uh, chicken and pork and eggs. Uh, those would be the, the worst things. Um, from the climate point of view, uh, avoiding beef as well. And of course, a lot of beef is quite intensively produced. Uh, so I think those, those are more important. I mean, if you want to go into other questions like palm oil, that, that's really a separate issue, of course, because there's, uh, you, know, you can eat palm oil whether you're a vegetarian or a meat eater. So there are many questions about buying organic, not buying organic, and so on. Um, there are many separate questions that people ask. But I think that uh, the, the, the single biggest contribution you can make through your food choices to a more ethical world is to avoid uh, factory farmed animal products. Mm -hmm.